From eastern lands they journeyed, kings heavy laden with gifts for the king. From nearby fields they journeyed, shepherds empty-handed but full-hearted for the shepherd. From Nazareth they journeyed, newlyweds with nowhere to stay, expecting and expectant. They journeyed into the night. Would you turn in your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2? You would expect any preacher at Christmas time to say those words because this is the story that so many of our songs, so many of our uh, traditions uh, come from. Uh, it's the story of the birth of Christ in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. So we're beginning a series that will take us through to Christmas Eve and even Christmas Day that is based on a theme that I'm going to uh, explain to you in just a minute. I want to begin, though, with a fable, a story you may have heard. It's a classic fable about an Arab that was sleeping in his tent on a cold night, and outside the tent was his camel. And uh, in the middle of the night, the camel spoke to the Arab. Of course, it's a fable, so in fables, camels talk. And uh, the camel said, you know, it's really, really cold out here. Do you think I could at least stick my head inside the tent just to get a little warm? And the Arab, being very generous, said, why, by all means, please stick your head in. So the camel did. Man went back to sleep. A little while later, camel woke him up again and said, hey, I'd hate to bug you again, but it really is desperately cold outside, I would just wonder, can I put my neck and front legs inside? That would really help me out a lot. The uh, Arab said, sure, uh, go ahead and I'll scoot over and you, you come on in a little bit. So he did. And then you can see where this is going. Eventually, uh, the camel just said, you know, it is just so cold. Could I just come all the way inside the tent? Well, the camel came inside the tent. Clearly, there was not enough room for both the camel and the Arab who had been sleeping in there. So finally, the camel said, look, there's not room for both of us here. It would be best if you would stand outside so there's room for me. <laughs> now, that little fable illustrates what has happened with Christmas. Jesus has been forced outside his tent while the secular world has dominated that tent. And more than that, it's what happened originally to Joseph and Mary, who had come to Bethlehem to an inn, but were turned out into the night to give birth to Jesus. Now, just a little bit of background before we even jump in, and that is, we, we typically celebrate Christmas as a nighttime event. It's part of Christian tradition. We believe that Jesus was born at night, and that is reflected in so many of our songs that we sing during this time of the year. O holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Or the song, Silent Night, Holy Night, All is Calm, All is Bright. Or the song, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear, that glorious song of old. Even the song, Said the Night Wind to the Little Lamb, Do You Hear What I Hear? And we could go on and on. That is part of the language of so many of our Christmas songs. The truth is, we're not told the exact timing of Jesus' birth, what time of day he was born at. We're pretty sure it was at night, and the reason I say we're pretty sure is we only have one clue, and the clue is in Luke chapter 2 in verse 8 where it says, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields keeping watch over their flock by night. That's the clue. So we think ostensibly that Jesus' birth was concurrent to the shepherds being in the fields at night, that must mean that Jesus was born at that time. That's the only clue. 
We're going to devote the rest of this month to messages about the theme of Christmas, and here's why. The birth of Jesus Christ was the most incredible birth of all times. In, in, in one sense, it was a normal birth. It was a birth like any and every other child. On the other hand, the child that was born was unlike any and every other child. Jesus' birth is what divides time. Uh, we talk about uh, the year 2022 A.D. and everything before that B.C., B.C., before Christ. A.D., Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord. His birth divided our calendar. So we mark time by his entrance into this world. So we're going to follow a theme, and the theme is into the night. Today we're looking at Joseph and Mary and Jesus' birth. And he was turned into the night. They were turned into the night by the innkeeper. Next week, we're going to look at the shepherds who are out in the field at night. They go into the night to Bethlehem to find this scene as the angel prescribed it, described it. And then they go back into the night to tell everybody else. The third week, we're going to look at the magi who followed the night star from Persia all the way to Jerusalem and eventually to Bethlehem. And that'll take us all the way to Christmas Eve, where the culmination of it will be John chapter 1, where it says of Jesus, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness could not comprehend it. Nighttime is also not only a physical reality, it is a spiritual metaphor. And we find that a lot in Scripture, right? The difference between light and darkness. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and he infers that people are in darkness. It's a metaphor for wickedness. It's a metaphor for ignorance, especially spiritual ignorance. It's a metaphor for sin. In the Bible, demons are called rulers of the darkness of this world. Paul said, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Listen, the world was and still is very dark. It is dark morally. It is dark politically. It is dark institutionally. It is dark educationally. It is dark personally. It is dark privately. It is dark professionally. And in any other way, it is a dark world. I remember being in school, and uh, we studied in history what my professor called the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages. You've heard of those. The Dark Ages, the medieval period in European history before the Renaissance uh, A.D. 500 to A.D. 1000 or 1200, when people were in ignorance, in darkness, the Dark Ages. Truth is, every age of mankind has been the Dark Ages. We're in the Dark Ages, and the age is getting darker and darker by the minute. Our greatest need, then, is always and ever to have the light of the world come in and dispel our darkness. As Jesus said, he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now today, we're going through the classic Christmas passage, Luke chapter 2. In fact, Luke is the only one uh, who writes about the event of the birth of Jesus Christ. So let's look at the text. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, Bethlehem, the city or the house of bread, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. 
So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. What I'd like to do in this beginning message is show you four aspects of this very first Christmas celebration. First, let's consider the season of Christmas. You'll notice in verse 1 that it begins by saying, and it came to pass, or it happened, it came about, in those days. In what days? Well, most of us think in the wintertime days, because that's when we celebrate Christmas. December 25th, it is just after the beginning of winter. Now, why do we think it's winter? Well, it's because it's always been celebrated that way. And by the way, the song even says, in the bleak midwinter, frosty wind made moan, earth stood hard as iron, water like a stone. There it is. It's in the song. Or we're going to sing the song probably, or you'll hear it at least, walking in a winter wonderland. Or I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. All of that language is wintertime language. Now, you're going to hear me in this series uh, refer to Christmas songs and compare them with Scripture and poke a little fun at some of these Christmas carols. I love Christmas songs. I really do. But uh, you, you need to know, if you don't already, that so much of our celebration of Christmas has been westernized and commercialized so that some of the stuff we do is really more cultural than it is scriptural. And what that means is all of our customs, all of our religious traditions that are not prescribed in Scripture are all subject to review. Would you agree with that? Uh, we we all, all want to take the stuff we've done, all the traditions, and compare them with the Scripture, and they are all subject to review. Truth of the matter is, we don't exactly know when Jesus was born. And I mean, not only do we not exactly know what time of day, we don't know exactly what day, we don't even know exactly what year he was born. You say, no, he was born in the year zero. No, actually, uh, by our calendar, he was born around 4 to 6 B.C., but that's only a guess. The Bible doesn't exactly tell us, because it doesn't think it's that important that we discover when. Um, I'll give you a clue, though. We do have clues. Happens to be the same verse that gives us the clue that it was at night. And it says in verse 8 that the shepherds were out in their fields with their flocks at night. So they're camping out with their animals. Now, do you think that was December 25th? I mean, did you check the temperature lately, uh, early in the morning? Um, Bethlehem's a little warmer than here, but it can snow in Bethlehem in the wintertime. It can get pretty cold. I know that sheep have nice jackets on. They have a lot of wool, right? They've got the fleece to keep them warm. But shepherds do not, and they weren't wearing North Face jackets from REI. They just had what they had in terms of a couple articles of clothing. But we do know that shepherds would go outside into the fields with their sheep from the months of March through November after which time they would bring their flocks back to town and put them in a sheepfold during the winter months. Not only that, but in verse 8, the verse that is providing the clue for us, it says, in the same country, shepherds were living out in the fields. And I found this I wanted to share with you from one source. The word used here for field denotes a specific type of cultivated land not just land in general. The fields in Israel are only found in a narrow mountainous strip in the center of the country around Jerusalem and Bethlehem. These fields were where farmers raised barley, wheat, and other grains. The wheat was typically harvested in late June and July. After the wheat had been completely harvested, there was a two-week period where the poor people could come in and glean the fields. If you know your Bibles, you know Leviticus uh, chapter 19 and chapter 23 talk about this. The book of Ruth is, takes place in that setting. 
He continues, only after the last day allowed for gleaning would the shepherds be allowed into the fields with their sheep to eat the stubble and whatever else remained. The time of year that they would have been allowed into the fields would have been approximately the first to the middle of August. They would have stayed in the fields eating and fertilizing until late September or mid-October, departing in time for the owners to prepare their fields for the next year's crop. Now that, that just messes with our whole notion of Christmas, right? August, that's like the exact opposite time of the year that we celebrate it. So where did the date December 25th come from? Well, you should know that the very first date put forth to celebrate the birth of Christ in history was by Clement of Alexandria. Clement of Alexandria, that's around 190 A.D. That's pretty early. The date he proposed was May the 20th. Others came along and tweaked it a little bit and said it was April 18th. Somebody else came along and said it was April 19th. And then even later on, somebody said March 28th. So take your pick. You can do March, you can do April, you can do May. What about December? Well, years later, third century, end of the third century, almost 300 A.D., a man by the name of Hippolytus of Rome. He was a theologian who lived in Rome. That's very important. Rome is a very important marker for us. Hippolytus is the first guy in history to say December 25th is the day we're going to celebrate Jesus' birth. And here's why. How this happened, we don't know. But for some reason, he was able to figure that Jesus um, was, or that Mary became impregnated with Jesus on exactly March the 25th. And he counted nine months to the date, which is December 25th. Now, that sounds made up to me, but there's a little bit of background to that. He lived in Rome. At the time, there were some very popular celebrations in Rome uh, that the pagans used to get involved in. Uh, two of them, one called Saturnalia, the other called Brumalia. Both of them celebrated the solstice, the winter solstice, the shortest day and then the days beginning to lengthen. So uh, one feast called Saturnalia was celebrated from December the 17th to the 24th. That is the festival of the unconquered sun. That was followed by Brumalia, December the 25th. That is the feast of the invincible sun because the days are getting longer and longer and longer. But get this, you know how the Romans celebrated those two feasts? Getting drunk and giving gifts. And there was mistletoe involved and a number of other things that have become tradition. So probably Hippolytus of Rome and some of the other theologians thought, let's put forth December 25th and use this not to endorse paganism per se, but to offer um, an alternative holiday and say, no, we're not going to celebrate your feast of the invincible sun, S-U-N. We believe in the invincible S-O-N, son of God, who has come into this world to turn people from darkness. That's probably their thinking. Now, maybe they thought that the whole world would say, yeah, and catch on and didn't quite happen the way they anticipated. But that's the season of Christmas. Let's now look at the occasion of Christmas. It says, it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. That's the occasion. A decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So, all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. There were two reasons why in ancient times a census would be taken. Number one was for military purposes. If you want to find out how many fighting men you have for a standing army, you take a census for that. Second reason, and probably this is the reason, for taxation purposes. To find out how many people are there to levy a tax to fund the government. And governments always do this. They always have. They always will. 
And it's amazing how governments figure out ways and study ways to tax us more. Ronald Reagan used to say, a government's view of the economy can be summed up in three phrases. If it moves, tax it. If it continues to move, regulate it. If it stops moving, subsidize it. Well, Caesar believed in all those things. And he burdened the people of Israel with taxes. About 25% of everybody's money went to funding the Roman government. Now that's because the Roman government provided perks. Caesar Augustus was an amazing ruler. He ruled for 45 years. Uh, he's the guy who instituted Pax Romana, the Roman peace, a relative stability around the world uh, by force. But it took money for that. It took tax money. And he figured out ways to collect that tax around the Roman world. Heard about a man who went to Acapulco on vacation. While he was down in Mexico, he heard a woman scream. He rushed over to the woman. He knew just enough Spanish to understand that that woman's child had swallowed a coin and was stuck in its throat. And just instinctively, he grabbed the child by the heels, turned it upside down, shook it just so, and out dropped a quarter. She was so grateful and said, Senor, thank you very much. Boy, you knew exactly how to get that out of him. You must be a doctor. He said, no, ma'am. I work for the United States Internal Revenue Service. <laughs> well, Caesar had a few guys like that working for him. And notice he is called here Caesar Augustus. Neither of those are his real name. Uh, Caesar is a title like uh, pharaoh or king or emperor. Uh, Augustus is a word that means uh, exalted one. Uh, or it means honored or majestic one. It was a name given to him by the Roman Senate in 27 B.C. His real name, his birth name, was Gaius Octavius or Octavian. Octavius Caesar was his name. He became the ruler. He was given the name August One or Honored One by the Roman Senate. By the way, they gave him a number of titles. One of the titles they gave him that was even inscribed in stone was Savior of the World. So here's this big wig, Caesar Augustus, making a decree that everyone on earth complies with, and that is for a census for the purpose of taxation. Now, notice a little footnote that Luke puts in in verse 3. So, it says, all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Scholars believe this was not a Roman requirement to go to your own city, your city of origin. They didn't care where you went to pay the tax. They just want the tax. They just want the money. You can give it in the city you happen to live in. And so most scholars believe this was a Jewish requirement. You probably know that the Jews were big into genealogical records, especially tribal allotments in Israel. And they wanted to know what people of what tribe are living where. And so they probably made the stipulation that everyone needs to go back to the uh, tribal allotment of origin. Joseph and Mary are up in Nazareth. That's the tribe of Zebulun, but originally they come from David's tribe of Judah, so they need to go back down south. But truth of the matter is, uh, the occasion for Christmas isn't so much Caesar doing this, but God doing this. Because if you were to just read the story in the New Testament of Joseph and Mary, and Mary's pregnant, and they're living up in Nazareth, uh, the story would have normally read that she would give birth to a child in Nazareth. That's where he lived. But um, the problem with that, if, if you know your Bibles, there was a prediction. And every Jewish person, by the way, knew a few things about the coming Messiah. And one thing they knew is the Bible was very specific as to where that Messiah was going to be born, right? And that was in Bethlehem. And that's because the prophet Micah, um, a few hundred years after David, 
but 700 years before Christ made this prediction, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, you're just a little nothing insignificant village, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. You might be a little town, but out of you is going to come forth somebody who is going to rule Israel, and then it says, whose going forth are from old, from everlasting. There's going to be a baby born in you, Bethlehem, that has an eternal nature, and he's going to eventually rule Israel. So here's, here's the real occasion of Christmas. Caesar was ruling on earth. God was overruling from heaven. Caesar was king of the world, but not to God. He's, just a pawn. He's not king on the chessboard. He's just a pawn. So it's like God looks at his chessboard and goes, there's Caesar. Bing. I'm going to put this in his head to make everybody get a census taken so that um, the Jews will say, got to go back to your town of origin so that Joseph and Mary will make the 90-mile trip from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. And so they do that. That's the occasion. Let's look at the location of Christmas. Verse 4, Joseph also went up from Galilee. Now that's just sort of worded strangely because Galilee is north and Jerusalem is south. So he is moving from north to south. So we would probably say Joseph went down from Galilee, out of Nazareth, to Judea. But the Jewish people reckon things not north, south, east, and west as much as topographically. Jerusalem is way high. They ascended from the valleys, and they would have gone up to Judea. But that's just a little FYI. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger. So they're in Judea, they're in Bethlehem, and Jesus was in a manger. Those are, that's the location. Now let me paint the picture just a little bit. They leave Nazareth. Nazareth is in the hill section of the north. They went down the hill from Nazareth into the valley. The first valley they would have gone through was called the Valley of Armageddon. They would have gone through that valley, through the central portion of the land, the little spine of mountains, and gone over into the Jordan Valley and followed the Jordan River Valley all the way down to Jericho. And from Jericho, they then would have uh, climbed upward into the Judean hills. Jerusalem is about 2,560 feet above sea level. Bethlehem is six, five, six miles away from Jerusalem. But that's a 90-mile trip, and they don't have public transportation. There's no buses. There's no trains. There's no private car taking Joe and Mary down there. They're on foot, and she's pregnant. And uh, maybe they had a donkey, maybe not, maybe a horse, maybe not. We don't know, but it's a 90, 85 to 90-mile trip. And it's dangerous to travel. You're exposed to the elements. You're all alone. There are robbers Along the way, Jesus even told a story. A man went from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among thieves, stripped him, beat him, took him his, his clothes, left him by the side of the road. That stuff really happened. And Joseph and Mary are taking that journey in reverse from the Jordan River Valley to Jericho and then up to Jerusalem. And then we are given this location. They get to Judea, they get to Bethlehem, and Jesus is born, and it says he is laid in a manger. A manger. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking a little wooden creche. 
And you're thinking that because, well, you've looked at your own nativity set that you put up at home. And there's a little wooden crib that is there. And all the nativity sets at Walmart have that. And, and so, why not? And this is where I wish I could take you to Israel. Because if I take it to Israel, I'll show you a manger. There are several examples all around the country. A manger was a piece of stone, not wood. It was about uh, three feet high. It was maybe four, five feet wide. It was just sort of cut out with a lip around it. They put fodder, animal food, hay uh, in that. And that was where animals ate their food. It was a feeding trough uh, made out of stone. That is a limestone manger. The Bible doesn't say that Jesus was born in a stable. Some think he was born in a cave. That's the earliest tradition. But we do know he is born in a manger, a stone manger. Because the word manger is mentioned not once, not twice, but three times in this chapter, I think it's significant. And I'm going to pause here for just a moment. You know, it says he was born in a man laid in a manger. When the angel gives a sign to the shepherds, says, okay, here's the sign. You're going to know this is the baby because this is the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and they, they stuck him in a manger. He's in a feeding trough. So you don't see that every day. When you get to Bethlehem, that'll be the sign. And then it says they get to Bethlehem and they see the baby. And indeed, he is laid in a manger. So three times the text belabors the facts so the audience knows this baby was put in a manger. So why is that significant? I think for two reasons. I think the fact that Jesus was laid in a manger, first of all, speaks of his humility. I mean, what could be more humble than a frail baby born to a poor couple in a cave in a feeding trough? That's as humble as you get. This was Paul's point in Philippians chapter 2. He made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant, coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He went from the highest to the lowest, from God in heaven to a baby born in Bethlehem. He was larger than the universe, but he became an embryo and a fetus and then a newborn baby. And he came in the humblest of wrappings, right? Swaddling cloths. I'll explain more of that next week. Not satin sheets, peasant cloths. Uh, he was not laid in a bed of gold, but a feeding trough. He was not waited on by the best physicians in Rome, but barnyard animals in their trough. You know, this is Christmas time, and we're all going to be getting presents or, or giving presents probably, um, and they're going to be wrapped up. We do that a lot. Some people are very elaborate in their wrapping. My mom taught me how to wrap presents. She was really good at it. I'm just marginal at it. But, but sometimes you get a gift, and it's just so amazingly wrapped. And I got to tell you, some gifts I've gotten, the wrapping is more impressive than the gift itself. Uh, not God's gift. When God gave the greatest gift, his own son, it's like wrapping it in a paper bag and giving it to the world. He didn't care about the wrapping. He cared about the gift. And this speaks of humility. The second thing the manger speaks to us about is accessibility. There's nothing intimidating about going to a manger. You don't need an ID card or credentials to get to a manger. Anybody can come to a manger if they're willing to humble themselves. You know, I've had the privilege of going to the White House a few different times in my lifetime. And, you know, to get into the White House, it's pretty hard, and it can be very intimidating. Uh, first of all, you have to be invited. You have to get your name on a list. To get your name on a list, they have to do some kind of vetting procedure, background check. Then once you get there, they got to look at the list to make sure that is your name on the list. Check your ID to make sure that the name on the ID is exactly the name on the list. It is reviewed by the Secret Service Department. You are admitted onto the grounds of the White House only after going through a metal detector, sometimes a pat-down. 
And then, uh, then you're monitored once you're on the property. They look at you very carefully to see if you're a weirdo. Now, when the shepherds get to where Jesus was born, they didn't need an ID card. Their name wasn't on a list. Didn't have to be on a list. The Magi, the same thing. They could just freely come. Accessibility. The manger was a preview of Jesus' whole life. He was always accessible to people. Whether it was a woman with an incurable disease for 12 years who pressed through the crowd to grab a hold of Jesus, or a Roman centurion who thought, I, I got to get my uh, servant who is dying, I got to get the attention of Jesus so, so he can heal him. Jesus was accessible to him. Or mothers trying to bring their babies to get Jesus uh, to bless them. And the disciples thought, no, you, can't. you just can't come to Jesus. You've you you got to have your name on a list. There's protocol here. Show us your ID badge. And Jesus said, uh, he rebuked them, the Bible says. And Jesus said, let the children come to me. For of such is the kingdom of God. And I just want you to know that God is accessible to you. And because he is accessible to you, you don't have to go through an intermediary. You don't have to pray to Mary or a saint or an angel. You can come right to him. And, and as a believer in Christ, you should come boldly to him. Boldly. That's what Hebrews 4 says. Come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So that's the location. Judea. Bethlehem, a manger. So that's the season, the occasion, and the location of Christmas. Let's close with this, the rejection of Christmas. That's verse 7. She brought forth her firstborn son. You know, Luke is the master of understatement. Here is the Messiah, the Son of God, the most anticipated birth in history. And Luke, he's a doctor. She brought forth her firstborn son. That's it. And wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because, here's the phrase, there was no room for them in the inn. We're not given a whole lot of detail. We don't know what the conversation between Joseph and the unnamed innkeeper was like. We don't know if it was an altercation, an argument. We don't know if it was, yeah, man, I understand. No, no problem, no big deal. We're just not given the information. Just as we're not sure where Jesus was eventually born, was it a cave, was it this or that, we're unsure exactly what this inn is, to be honest with you. And the reason I say that is because the word used here for inn is a different word than is typically used in the Greek New Testament for the word inn. By the way, if you're thinking of like Ramada Inn, or, or Holiday Inn, uh, don't. Uh, it's not like, yeah, they had breakfast in the morning and room service and a swimming pool. No, it was no holiday, this inn. The word used here for inn really just means a shelter of some kind. Now, this is what I think it was. I believe that the inn was a caravansary. Now, a caravansary is where caravans would stay. Caravans would travel from one place to another place, and they would stay at an inn, a caravansary, which is right off the side of the road, right by the road. It was a square enclosure, four buildings placed in a square with a large courtyard in the middle, two stories. So uh, buildings, 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 with a gate that would allow you to bring your animals and feed them and care for them in the courtyard in the open air while you yourself stayed in one of the rooms. That was an inn. So it could be that they were turned away from the sleeping place and spent the night in the open courtyard where the animals were being fed. There would be plenty of mangers there. And out of that inn enclosure in the open air into the night, they were put. Hard to imagine. A nine-month pregnant girl. By the way, she was probably no older than 14. 
She was between 13 and 14. That was the typical years that a Jewish girl gave birth in that culture. Joseph himself was probably no older than 16. Imagine a young couple like that, and she's with child being pushed away into the night. The light of the world being cast out. That's the rejection of Christmas. Now, I point that out, and you've heard this before, but this scene is replicated every year. In fact, I would say this scene is replicated every day of every week of every month of every year. There's no room for Jesus in the public square. Uh, they don't want you to talk about Jesus in normal society. Um, they certainly don't want you to talk about Jesus when it comes to politics. And if I hear one more person tell me, separation of church and state, man, if you're religious, don't you dare weigh in on political issues, you know, I'm going to pull my hair out. Some of you say, I'd like to see that. Um, that phrase, by the way, has nothing to do with spiritual people weighing in on political matters. It was originally put so that the political world, the government, could not impinge upon our worship and the spiritual world. But we'll push that aside for the time being. The Roman government didn't want him. Herod the great, the Jewish part of the Roman government, didn't want him. In fact, they will try to kill him. So there's no room for Jesus in the political world. There was no room for Jesus in the religious world. The religious leaders knew Bethlehem is where Messiah was to be born. They even quote, as we'll see in a couple weeks, they cite chapter and verse. But they wouldn't walk a few miles to see if that was the one that these guys from the east came to check out. 30 years later, the religious world will want to kill Jesus. Now, they'll come up with a plot to get him crucified. There's not even room for Jesus at Christmas time. Talk about, talk about the camel taking over the tent. Um, you can't even say Merry Christmas anymore. Oh, no, 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 no. It's Happy Holidays at best. Um, when, when I see people, I, I often say Merry Christmas, and every now and then I'll get somebody, I'll say Merry Christmas, and they'll go, yeah, Happy Holidays. And then I'll go, Merry Christ Mass. <laughs> his name happens to be in that word. It's his celebration. He's the one we're honoring. In school, it's not even a Christmas break anymore. Have you noticed what it's called? It's just winter break. Yeah, yeah the camel is inside the tent. There's just no room for Jesus. That's the way it's always been. And you've got to know something. If you, if you make room for Jesus in your heart, in your life, the world will have no room for you. They'll marginalize you. They'll scorn you. Yeah, just, just notice this. Look at the end of verse 7. Because there was no room for... What's the word after that? There was no room for them did not say him. They're not just saying, we have no room for Jesus. We have no room for anybody associated with him. And Mary and Joseph's whole life was wrapped around that Jesus child that would be born. So they were, there was no room for them in the end. But I want to share with you the great news to close this out with. In the Gospel of John, it says, He came into his own, his own received him not. Right, no room. He came into his own, his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become children of God to those who believe in his name. All of that to say this. If you make room for him, he'll make room for you. If you make room for Jesus, Jesus will make room for you. Jesus will say to his disciples, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I've made room for you. You make room for me, I'll make room for you. And that's what we are left with. Make room for Jesus. Father, this is a familiar story we hear it every year. We read it probably every year. 
Even unbelievers know this. One of the most famous chapters in all of Scripture. But Lord, um, thank you that we've been able to just drill a little bit deeper as to the season, the occasion, the location, but this whole idea of, of receiving or rejecting is something that has played out every single day. And every time an offer is made of salvation, a choice is always made. And, and that is, I'm going to receive him or I'm not going to receive him. And to not receive him is to reject him. As Jesus himself said, you are either for me or you are against me. And so, Lord, we come to that moment, that place right now. And I pray that some who are gathered here and those who are being a part of our online community, if they haven't, would say yes to the Savior. And say, no, I don't want Jesus to leave my in, my soul, my heart. I want him to take up residence there. I want him to live there. I'm inviting him in. And so if you're here today, or if you're online and you have access to this message and God has touched your heart, you know, it could be that you are a person who has some formal belief in God, you were raised in a church environment. You have a hunch that there's something or someone up there, or, or maybe even more than that, you're sure there is somebody up there. But the truth of the matter is, on a personal basis, a daily personal reality, Jesus Christ is not the king of your heart, the king of your life. You've personally not received him and asked him to come in, asked him to forgive you of your sins. I want to give you the opportunity to change all that. As many as received him, that's the verse I quoted, to them he gave the power, the authority, the right, the privilege to become children of God, sons and daughters of God, to those who believe in his name. I'm going to give you an opportunity to believe in his name this morning. So if you're here today and you've never said yes to Jesus personally, or maybe you have, but you're not obeying him today. You've walked away from him, and you need to come back home to him. If that describes you, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, just so it's not intimidating to you. If, if you're willing to say yes to Jesus, would you raise your hand up in the air? Just raise it up in the air and keep it up for a moment. I want to acknowledge you, and then I want to pray for you as we close. Raise it up so I can see it. If you're saying, I want to say yes to Jesus today. I want to give him my heart and my life. God bless you. Over to my left and toward the back. Anybody else? Raise that hand up. Right there in the middle. Yes, ma'am. And up front. Who else? You could be in the family room. Raise your hand up. If you've not done it personally, God bless you. Awesome. Awesome. Anybody else? Anybody in the balcony? Father, thank you for those who have raised their hands. Behind that hand is a heart. Behind that number is a name. Behind that statistic is a story. You love these so deeply. Strengthen them. Help them to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. We're going to close in a song. But as we close in this song, I'm going to ask you to do something that maybe you, you thought I would do, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to ask those of you who raised your hands to put feet on your faith. And I'm going to ask you to step out of where you're seated. Find the nearest aisle. Uh, bring the lights up, please, a little bit. We don't want people stumbling in the dark. Um, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Uh, so uh, we want them to be able to see. So uh, as we sing this song, I want you to find the nearest aisle and come stand right up here. When you're up here, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. We're going to make this a, a done deal. Come up. Come right now. If you're in the family room, come through the door and come through the hallway and stand right up here. Just come and stand. Come all the way up.
Make it personal, make it real, make it your own. Just come. Turn around this way. God bless you. Nice to see you. Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you know God. God has your number. He's been poking at your heart for a long time. He's been saying, yes, you need this. Yes, you. You need this. You need me. You can't live life on your own. You've tried, right? Admit it. You've tried. Hadn't worked. How's that working out for you? Not too good. It's because your life isn't complete without him. You need the forgiveness of sins. You were born to know God. You want to get to know God? It's through Jesus. So uh, if your life is in that place where you're seeking hope and fulfillment, forgiveness, you get up and come and do it right now. Just say excuse me to the person next to you, find the nearest aisle, and come on up here. prayer. And I just want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. Say these words from your heart. Give your life to the God who made you. So say this. Say, Lord, I give you my life. I admit that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died on the cross. I believe he shed his blood for me. And I believe he rose again. I turn from my sin. I turn to Jesus as Savior. I want to follow him as Lord. Help me. It's in his name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We'd love to know how this message impacted you. Share your story with us. Email my story at calvarynm.church. And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, visit calvarynm.church/give.